In this video, we are going to look at the assembly line, which is a precursor to the idea of the pipeline that we will be using in order to improve the implementation performance of CPUs. In order to understand the concept of an assembly line, we are going to take an analogy. And the analogy that we are going to work with over here is how do we go about building a car? And the steps that I'm going to propose for building a car are, let's start by building the frame of the car. Once we have the frame of the car, the next step would be perhaps add some wheels, add the doors of the car, put in an engine, and finally add a steering wheel. And well, it's close enough, right? When it looks like a car, hopefully it runs like a car. Of course, there are many steps over here involved but at a high enough level, just to at least convey the idea, this should be enough in order to say what are the main steps involved in building a car. Okay, so now how would this actually get done in a factory? Inside a factory, you would typically have cupboards or shelves or rooms perhaps full of different parts of the car. There would perhaps be one room which is full of frames another that's full of wheels, yet another that's full of doors that need to be put into the cars, engines and steering wheels. Let's assume that we have already neatly partitioned these out into different places. Now along comes the car assembly technician whose job is to actually build the car. How is he go, going to go about doing this? The car assembly technician has some kind of a workplace, a workstation perhaps, where he is going to do his work. The first thing he needs to do is go and fetch a frame and keep it in the place where he's going to build the car. The next step is to go and get some wheels. As you can see, he now has to go a bit further away than where the frames were, fetch the wheels, bring them back. The doors, once again, he has to go all the way up to the doors, get them and bring them back and then attach them in this place. Then comes the engine. And finally, the steering wheel, where at least in the way I've drawn it over here, it's quite a walk, right? So apart from the fact that the technician now needs to walk around all over the factory floor to pick up parts, the second thing you will see is that the technician needs to be an expert on all parts of the car. He needs to know how the frame is to be built, how the wheels attach to the frame, how the doors are attached, how the engine fits in and works, and finally, how to put the steering wheel in place. Now that's great if you have one expert technician who can do all of this. But how do you get more cars out of the factory? After all, those rooms containing the frames, wheels and so on are sitting out there. And it seems like a waste of time to have only one person sitting out there building these cars. Let's add a few more technicians. So the second technician is, let's say, halfway through. He's done with the frames and wheels, needs to go and fetch the door. The third technician is not yet there. He has just got the frame and needs to go and fetch the wheels. The way I have drawn it at least, it looks as though he would be intersecting with the second technician. So while one, one is going to get the doors, the second would be going to get the wheels, they, their paths need to cross, they would need to make sure they don't bump into each other and so on. And finally, the fourth technician is also at the same stage as the second and needs to go and get the doors. Who gets priority? Who gets to get a door first? Do they get stuck waiting for one another or is there some way by which they can resolve this amicably? And while all this is happening, of course, you would notice that the first technician has actually finished his job. He's an expert, he's done well, and the quality of the cars he builds is probably better than what the others have done. Now, this is okay. This is definitely one way to build cars, but there are a few problems that we can notice from this setup. Where do we store the items? We don't want the technicians to be running around all over the factory to get them to their workstations. Second question is, how do you even get such heavy items to the construction site? The third question is, how do we train these builders or technicians? And clearly, there will be quality differences. Good builders will be able to do a much better job than someone who is just a beginner. But at the end of the day, each of them is going to build a car. And it's very likely that the differences will show. There is an alternative which is that each worker does only one job. Let's say one person specializes on assembling frames. 
the sex, uh, second person specializes in fixing doors the third person on fitting and tuning engines and so on the good thing here is you can now keep the parts near the worker so that that particular worker does not need to run around they know that they are going to work only on one particular thing let's say doors and the doors are kept right next to them in this scenario what we are going to do is to move the car from one worker to the next rather than making the workers run around behind the car what does this look like we would have once again all the equipment that we need but in this case our workers would be standing in front of their respective specializations so there would be one technician handling frames another handling wheels doors engines and steering wheels what does the car assembly itself look like this is where the major innovation comes in we are going to make a moving belt the first technician takes a frame and assembles it or does whatever he needs to right in front of him once he is done with it he says okay now the car can move on maybe he presses a button and the car then moves on to the next person which means that car 1 that was started by the first technician is now standing in front of the wheels section and the person who is in charge of wheels has now fitted wheels onto car 1 but now the first technician has pulled out a new frame and got started on car number 2 what happens after that we then move on car number 1 has got its door fitted car number 2 has now got wheels and car number 3 has just started further down the line car number 1 now has an engine in place car 2 has got its doors car 3 has got wheels and car 4 has just started and finally car number 1 gets its steering wheel and is done it's ready to roll off the assembly line as they say and probably needs to go for painting and then get into the store to be sold car 2 is almost there it's got its engines in place car 3 has got doors car 4 has got wheels and car 5 has already got started as you would notice what is effectively happening over here is many different things happen one is that each technician only needs to specialize on one particular task the second is as soon as one technician is done with his or her job they can just stop working and wait until the entire assembly line moves forward so let's say the person fitting wheels is able to work very fast it doesn't matter they would still need to wait for whoever is the slowest over here maybe engines take a long time right so until the engines are done the belt cannot move which means that a person fitting wheels might just be sitting idle what you could probably do in such a situation is give more work to the person fitting wheels so that you try and balance out the work for each of the different parts of the assembly line but the important point over here is by moving the car rather than the technicians you bring a lot of efficiency and more importantly each of the technicians can be kept busy for a much larger fraction of time where did this first come into the picture it's not clear if henry ford was the person who invented this assembly line there are indications that the basic ideas were already in place and in fact somebody else had already proposed this and tried it out in some places but the ford motor company was definitely one of the places where this became more or less standardized this is a picture of how the initial ford automobiles were assembled as you can see there is a moving belt over there and each of the technicians is pretty much just standing in his place and doing one specific job what we can sort of compute from this is a few different things one of them is what fraction of the time is a given worker busy and if you find that a worker is sitting idle quite a large fraction of the time it probably means that you need to balance your assembly line a little bit maybe somebody is overworked you try and take out some of their work and give it to the person who is a bit more idle are all stations doing useful work all the time that's one of the questions that we can ask another related thing that comes up over here of course is each worker is specializing which means that the quality actually starts to become homogenized a person who is making frames only specializes on frames which means that all cars the frame is made by the same person and the quality is more or less going to remain the same now how is all of this relevant to processor design 
Executing instructions inside a CPU can also be thought of as multiple different pieces of work that need to be done. And you can think in terms of multiple workstations. And what I mean by workstations in this case are the instruction memory from which you need to fetch an instruction, the decoder that is responsible for splitting out the instruction and sending parts of it to the control logic and parts of it to the register file and so on, the register file itself from which we need to read data out, the ALU that does the actual computations, the data memory from which we might be getting data back and so on. We can once again think of the overall process of executing an instruction as something where the instruction needs to flow through these different stages and finally come out at the other end as a completed instruction. And in analogy with the automobile assembly line, we can think of moving the instruction along the hardware. The, the crucial, the crucial insight over here is that once the hardware is done with executing a single instruction, let's say the instruction memory has just given us a particular instruction. And if I could store that somewhere in a register, I can then go ahead and try to fetch the next instruction while waiting for the rest of the execution of the instruction to complete. Of course, there are problems over there. In particular, you might imagine that when branches happen, then how would you go about fetching the next instruction? What happens after all you have different loads, stores, ALUs, and so on, they don't all use the same hardware. Those are problems that need to be solved, of course, but they can be solved. And that is essentially one of the ma main ways by which we get really high performance processor designs. We will look at that in a future video.